In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. In two weeks' time, the 19th All-American Council of the Orthodox Church in America will open in St. Louis. And representatives from all of the parishes and institutions across all the different dioceses of the church in North America will meet together. The theme of the assembly this year is for the life of the world, for the life of the world. And some of you will recognize, of course, the title of a book by Father Alexander Schmemann that was first written in 1963, which, of course, itself comes from a phrase in the liturgy, and which is derived from the Gospel of John, for the life of the world. And Metropolitan Tikon, his beatitude, has put out a document that he encourages not only those who will be assembling in St. Louis at the assembly, but all faithful clergy of the Orthodox Church in America to read. It's about 40 or 50 pages, entitled For the Life of the World, and it's an invitation to consider what it is that the church is all about. What is the mission of the church for the life of the world? And of course, to state that is, first we must ask, what life? What do we mean by life? And what do we mean, for that matter, by world? To ask such questions is to do as we have been doing recently as we've been looking at Gospels together, is to ask, what's the story? What's the big picture here? What is the narrative to, what, to, to which we belong? What life is it that we desire? What life is it that we desire to convey to the world? Who are we? Where are we? Where are we going? What time is it? All of those big questions. And if you've been following along lately with the epistles, reading either in your daily prayer or listening attentively on Sundays, of course, we've been reading from St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. And that's what he's been all about in that epistle. Because, of course, he had belonged to and grown up with one story, one way of looking at the world given to him by, by his Jewish culture in first century Palestine, with all of the hopes and expectations of how God would fulfill his promises to Israel. It would be a national fulfillment, a national overturning of oppression, an end to exile, and God would reign as king and the temple would be renewed in Jerusalem. This is what Paul was expecting. And when this ragtag bunch of miscreants comes along proclaiming a certain uh, you know, itinerant prophet, uh, prophet from Galilee as the Messiah, Saul, as he was at the time, sets about persecuting them, simply because they don't match the story that he'd been told. This isn't the life, this isn't the world, this isn't the purpose, the story, the narrative that I belong to. And the persecution is pretty vicious indeed, as we know. He allows early Christians to be put to death until that moment of encounter with the risen Lord Jesus, which shifts his perspective, which takes him out of one way of looking at the world, one story, and puts him into another. Yes, indeed, God is faithful to his covenant and to his people Israel, but it doesn't look the way you were expecting. The Lord Jesus is Lord and has become king. And precisely by hanging on a cross, he reigns now. And by rising from the dead, the new kingdom has been started. And it's available now, not physically as you were expecting with someone sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem and the temple renewed, but in a new kingdom, a new temple, a new form of worship in the body of Christ himself. We heard this morning at Matins in the encounter of the Lord Jesus with the apostles 
how he said and he opens the scriptures to them and they understand through the prophets and the psalms and the law that this was what was meant to happen they'd been in the wrong story they'd had it off center off focus and now the lord jesus in his risen form comes to them and focuses their attention on precisely the narrative they should have been paying attention to all along that he indeed is the fulfillment and they are indeed to worship him and they are witnesses he says you are witnesses of these things and you have spread this from jerusalem to all the world for the life of the world this is the new narrative into which we have been placed by our baptism and chrismation like the apostle paul when he falls off his horse and he's blinded by the light of the risen Christ. So too, by our baptism and chrismation, are we brought to this place where we can see life and the world through a different lens and through the lens of God's real story, the story that was written from the beginning, his purposes from the beginning, which have never changed, to which he's always been faithful, a covenant which he has been molding and recrafting and now is open to all, not merely to the peculiar nation of Israel, but to a new Israel that encompasses old and new, the whole world. St. Paul in this morning's epistle is still working that through. The whole of Romans is about him having come to this understanding, making sense of first Genesis in the first chapters of the, the epistle to the Romans and about the promise made to Abraham and how it is consistent. And Abraham was justified, that is to say, made a member of the covenant by faith, which is still the way in which we are made members of God's covenant by our faithful response to God's love and action. And he goes on to explore in, the, in that later sections with Exodus as the narrative backdrop, the, the purpose of the law, the law which was to reveal a holy people a holy nation, a royal priesthood called after God's name that would give glory to him through all the world. And although that failed in the people of Israel, that is not the end of God's work. He continues to recraft that and by raising up the one in their midst, himself incarnate in the Lord Jesus as Messiah, he sums up all the law and in himself fulfills it. He encapsulates Israel. He becomes Israel. And therefore, all the law and the prophets are fulfilled. And that covenant is open to all by his own person, by our being grafted into his body. This morning's epistle is taken from the beginning of chapter 9, where so often we think this is a bit of a, an excursus or a sidetrack where he thinks, well then what of old Israel? Those who haven't come in, some have come to believe like the apostles and some after, but more and more by the point he's writing to the Romans, it's the Gentiles <coughs> who are receiving the proclamation of the gospel. So what of old Israel? Well, St. Paul's working that narrative through and figuring what is my place in that story? Now, over and again, he's, trying, he's asking that question, what life, what world, and to whom, and what are, what are we doing? What is our place within that? His answer, I'll give in brief, it was, we explored this fully last year. I refer to you to YouTube if you'd like to see what is probably my longest ever on, on Romans 9 to 11. But in the answer, in short, is that the imagery he gives is of the, of the potter and clay. And we make the mistake sometimes of thinking old Israel was like a pot of clay that was already fired and glazed. And in order to go from old covenant to new, the Lord shatters the one, breaks it, casts it aside, and creates a new pot. But for St. Paul, it's not like that at all. The, the pot had never been fired, never been glazed. It's the, the clay being shaped in the potter's hands continues to be molded. That same covenant of the old covenant to Israel is the new covenant. And it's just being molded to allow in Christ all to enter in. And what of those who have yet to receive? Well, he compares 
the Gentiles to wild branches of olives that are grafted into the cultivated vine, which of course is the inverse of what you do if you're cultivating either olives or grapes or whatever, right? You take cultivated vines and graft them on to the wilder shoots which have the vitality but not the production. And the vitality gives life to the cultivated vines that have the fruit. Well, St. Paul inverses the image Old Israel is the cultivated vine into which the Gentile wild shoots are grafted. And he says, hardly, that is to say, scarcely will they be saved by difficulty because it's much easier to work with the cultivated branches. So the branches that have been cut off for a time, what of them? Well, if Christ sums up all of Israel, and he himself is the one who goes into exile for our salvation, the one who goes outside the city and hangs on a tree, exiled, alienated from all, then that is the image of Israel cast aside for a time. In old Israel, we have an icon of the very humiliation and crucifixion of Christ himself, ultimately, they will come in. Ultimately, all will be saved, St. Paul says. But for a time, they are an icon of Christ's humiliation and rejection and alienation for us all. Enough of St. Paul and his placing himself in the narrative. Let's come back for a moment just to this question of for the life of the world. So, you know, Father Alexander Schmemann obviously through all of his writings, answers this question of what narrative do we belong to by looking through the lens of the liturgy. So I say, we've been brought to this place. How do we make sense of our lives, of all the places we've come from, of where we're going to, of all those little stories we tell ourselves all the time about our own identity and place and purpose? Well, we look through the lens of the liturgy, and that's what places us within God's wider story. I'll give you one example. And it comes from, again, Father Alexander. Because a couple of years after he wrote For the Life of the World, he wrote an essay or wrote a, a presentation that he gave at a symposium called Freedom in the Church. I quoted a little bit of it in this week's newsletter. And why that's important is that in some senses, the world we live in today is absolutely caught in a narrative of freedom and authority being made to be opposites, a dichotomy, right? If you think about that for a moment, the last five or six decades anyway, and if you really delve into it, probably since the Enlightenment, that has been the struggle of our society, right? Freedom defined as what? A rejection of authority, a loosening of the grip of authority. So they're made to be opposites. And so if you go out into the world, ask any question, you know, whether it's about moral issues or sexuality or gender identity or everything, it's always framed in these terms. My own freedom against an external authority. Perhaps it's the authority of the state or the, the authority of my parents or my boss at work or my teacher or really comes right down to it. It's somehow the external authority of God or the church. It's something I have to escape from. And we define ourselves by that little bit of freedom that we can somehow carve out against these authorities which we are otherwise subjugated to. That's been the dialectic, the story of our society. Think of the 1960s when Father Alexander Schmemann is living, right? Authority and freedom and that great conflict. You know, and 51 years ago, people were putting flowers in their hair and driving to San Francisco because they wanted to throw off all authority. They wanted to live in a liberated state, to have that freedom, right? And the story since then, we may have stopped putting the flowers in our hair and taking LSD, but the point is, daily people live this kind of a life. What, how can I be myself free from all of these constraints? So freedom opposed to authority. And as certain philosophers 
have shown to us, though, that freedom, if we continue to seek it, will ultimately murder authority. It will kill the czar, or it will murder God himself, as Nietzsche says. It seeks continually freedom, 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 until all authority just dies, and then freedom itself is destroyed. This dichotomy between freedom and an authority, authority understood as the church, has been the story of Western, Western Christendom as well. If you think about the Protestant Reformation, freedom from the church, individual freedom, and then the Counter-Reformation, reasserting the authority of the church over the individual, and that battle has been continuing in Western Christianity. Well, what's interesting for Father Alexander Schmemann, he quotes Alexei Komiakov, who was one of the Russian Slavophile philosophers and theologians of the 19th century. And Komiakov says this, it's shocking to us who have this idea of authority and freedom on either side. He says, if you say the church is an authority, then you are saying a falsehood and you blaspheme. God is not an authority. Christ is not an authority. The church is not an authority, he says. What could he mean? He says an authority is something external. It's something outside of us. It's something which we either make into our ruler or our judge or our opponent, our enemy. An authority like that, an authority as defined by Western history over the last few centuries, is this external reality. And God, Christ, and the church are not that at all. They can never be that. If we allow them to be that, then Christianity is lost. Our faith is over. There's no hope. True freedom is the church. Because true freedom is the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. And how does the Holy Spirit dwell within the church but internally? internally to us as a community, the community that enables us to come together, to worship God, to open the scriptures, and to see the truth of God's story written. But the Holy Spirit who dwells also within us, who indwells us by our baptism and chrismation, the Holy Spirit who leads us into true freedom. If we say freedom is opposed to authority, those ideas are from a different world. They're from the fallen world. So we ask the life for the life of the world. What world? Are we talking about working within the concept and the constructs and constraints of the fallen world? No, indeed. In the church, we have access to the new world, the new kingdom. And freedom here is not opposed to authority. Freedom is the very life of the church. A freedom, as it says in that bit I did quote in the newsletter yesterday, a freedom that is ultimately manifested mainly in obedience. Obedience to the Father. But obedience here isn't accepting an external authority. And obedience means union, unity with God the Father. Christ is obedient to the Father unto death, St. Paul says not as to an external authority, one who gives up his freedom for the sake of a judge or an external ruler, but one who unites his will entirely with that of the Father. Now, how would it be if that was our story? If we didn't accept freedom and authority in terms the world story sets it out? So in every question, whether it's medical assistance in dying, take that for a moment, which is all about my own freedom <coughs> to, to oppose the authority of anyone else telling me what to do with my body, right? I'm going to carve out that freedom. I want that right. I want that choice. But that's not, if we take it back into the terms of God's story, that's not how that works. Our freedom is exercised in union with God, in union with God's purpose for our life, with God's ultimate story. And we need to reframe our life daily, minute by minute, in terms of the bigger picture. And so on and so forth. Every issue you might think of, which is 
at the heart of divisions in our society, all of the moral issues of our day, they're always being presented as, here's the authority, do this, do that, think this, think that, uh, uh, adhere to this structure. Or on the other hand, I want to be free from that, I make my own decisions, I determine my own identity, my own destiny. And neither is right because both are fallen. In the church, freedom is the life of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, in his Christ, who is obedient to the Father because of his union with him. That's our story. And that, when we ask for the life of the world, begins to frame how we understand what true life is. True life is to live according to the story, the narrative that tell us the purpose of God. And the world is a world reframed by the vision of the kingdom, where we don't accept the terms and divisions and dichotomies of this world, but we bring the news, the good news, the gospel of faith, which redefines these things, which makes it possible for people to truly achieve freedom without this opposition, without this struggle, this pointless struggle in a fallen world against authority. We'll continue to explore for the life of the world in the weeks to come, both in the lead up to and following the assembly. But I wanted to just give you this as way of introduction. I do commend to you the, the whole document. I commend to you, of course, Father Alexander Schmemann's book, For the Life of the World. Some of you I know have read it. It's one which explores these kinds of things, but ultimately invites us to come together and to look at the world through the lens of liturgy. Liturgy is not this thing that we do and we leave aside on a Sunday morning, it becomes our life. The way the liturgy presents God and his purposes for us is how we are supposed to be reformed and reshaped in our life. So through the prayers of all of our saints, may we truly learn what it is to bring life to this world.